all of us this morning, members and visitors alike. If you're a visitor, we want to recognize you. You'll find this little white card in the pew in front of you. Address your name and information here, and then put this little sticker on so we can greet you with a warm countryside welcome. Please read all the announcements in the bulletin, and they'll be up on the screen as well. But we welcome you all this morning. We hope you're all well. Those that aren't well, we hope you recover soon. Thanks.
Good morning. Well, join me in the call to worship. God called Abraham and Sarah and promised to bless them. Through faith they obeyed and received the God called Isaiah and Jacob as heirs of that promise. God calls us to join them as heirs and the faithful. We welcome heir, stewarded by the hope that was fulfilled in the lives of our servants. Brothers and sisters in faith, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in that, I invite you to please now join with me as we pray today's prayer of confession together. Let us pray. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. Yet think with me, Christ came to earth for us, showed us how to live. He died for us, rose again and walked among us for several days. But in the end before then, he ascended into heaven and he promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, which indeed did come. Christ sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, not to condemn us, but rather to forgive us. So I encourage you, know that you are forgiven and be at peace.
Well, today we once again turn to the Gospel according to Luke. I'll be reading from the 12th chapter, verses 32 through 40. Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The word of the Lord. Communication. That's what I want to talk about briefly this day in this communion meditation. There's all kinds of ways that we communicate both verbally and non-verbally from one person to another, from one person to a group of people, But one of the things I think is most interesting in communication is a parent to a child. A friend of mine sent me this two weeks ago and she swears it's true. It's um, posted on Twitter. Now be honest with you, I have no idea what a Twitter is. (laughs) I've never tweeted in my life. And though my mother, God rest her soul, knew how to Facebook, I don't. But here's what she said actually happened. A dad named named Rodney LaCroix posted the following thoughts on Twitter. What I say, be ready. We are leaving in five minutes. What the child hears, get undressed, Start finger painting and lose at least one shoe. (laughs) Sounds realistic to me. This text has Jesus desperately trying to communicate to his disciples. What's the situation here? It's nearing his three years of ministry being concluded And Jesus is trying yet again to communicate with his disciples. And if you know the story up to this point, you know he has tried before, but they still don't seem to understand what's about to happen. Jesus wants to prepare them for first the fact that he is going to die. And the second thing he wants to communicate to them is that after his death, they are to carry out his work on this earth. One commentator said, the whole of chapter 12 in Luke could be summed up in these words, wake up, get ready. Jesus is trying to get them ready. At this time, he is, as has been the case for a while, surrounded by perhaps as many as a thousand people 
who desperately want to hear this man, Jesus from Nazareth. They've heard amazing things that he has done. Healings, miracles. He has the opportunity now to turn and face the large crowd. And he could do a few miracles. He could do some things that would make them go ooh and ah. But Jesus knows two things the disciples don't. The first is obedience, not popularity, is what God is looking for. And he, though he's tried to tell them, he knows he is going to the cross to die. And they need to be prepared. So Jesus speaks not to the crowd, but to that small group of the people, the disciples who have been following him now for years. Verse 32 is important. He says to the disciples, do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus wants to comfort them because he knows that after they finished following him, after his death and resurrection, after the coming of the Holy Spirit and they begin to continue his work, these people will be religious outcast. They will be enemies of the state for the rest of their lives. They will live with persecution, beatings. They will, some of them, be jailed and some will give their very lives for the work of the gospel. If they're going to survive all that's coming, Jesus knows this, they need to see the future not through their eyes, but through Jesus' eyes. Those are words we should pay attention to. If we see the future through Jesus' eyes, then we can refuse to live in fear. Trust me, I see the same news you do. I see stories of amazing hatred and anger and violence. And it scares me too. But if we see the future through the eyes of Christ, we do not need to live in fear. I know some of you have read your Bible multiple times through. So think with me. Throughout the scriptures, old and new, any time a human being has an encounter with God or an encounter with an angel from God or in the day an encounter with Jesus, what are the first words said? A variation of, don't be afraid. Be not afraid. We need not be afraid if we can look through the future through his eyes and not our own. In 33, Jesus is telling us to uh, get rid of the things that control us. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourself that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven. 
There's no doubt that throughout Scripture we see that God cares for the least of these, the people that are outcast to society, the widows, the orphans, the lepers. David Getz wrote a book that I've just read called Death by Suburb, How to Keep the Suburbs from Killing Your Soul. Just a very few sentences. He says that chasing after quote unquote immortality symbols distracts us from living as followers of Jesus. We get so tired to status and comfort and achievement. We find our identity in our jobs, our self-worth, worth in our paycheck or our possessions. We spend our lives building up and protecting our own little, comfortable, safe existence. And we completely miss the calling to follow Jesus as citizens of a heavenly kingdom, indeed a kingdom that we are to help build on this earth. Well, how are we supposed to build that kingdom, Pastor Gary? I go to 35. It's about being ready. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Can't get much simpler. Look for opportunities to help build Jesus' kingdom on earth. Our service to others is the key. We need to be ready to serve others when we can, to serve him as he would serve them, to the very best of our abilities, so that we will be ready when he comes again. Dr. Robert Schuler, you remember, was pastor of the Crystal Cathedral in California. I had not heard this story, but it goes like this. At one point, he knew Mother Teresa was going to be near his city in California. He invited her to come and meet with him in his office. You remember Mother Teresa, who served the least of them in Calcutta. Dr. Schuler asked Mother Teresa to give him some words of wisdom for his ministry. And I want you to listen to these words, she said, because they are just like most all the things I've read from her. They are to the point, period. He liked this, these words so much, he had them made into a plaque and put them in his office. Mother Teresa said to this pastor, do this. He said, she said, be all and only for Jesus. And then, let him use you without consulting you first. Be all and only for Jesus. And be prepared to let him use you without consulting you first. That's communication. Please join me in the public statement of faith. Um, you can find it on page 14 in your hymnal, and it'll be up there. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. The third day he arose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, you offer us unfailing treasure in heaven. In love and gratitude for your gifts to us, we return these gifts and offerings to you. Use them and stretch them to ease the plight of the poor and the widow, the orphan and the downtrodden. 
Use us and stretch us that we may do good, seek justice, and be your light in the world. Amen. say it every time because I mean it. As a pastor, it is a privilege to invite you this day not to the table of the Presbyterians, but to the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All who believe that Jesus was and is the Messiah are welcome to partake in this sacrament. You'll have an option of how to receive the elements. If you like, when you come forward, there'll be two, four stations with two people. Anyway, the first person you see will have a bread, basket with bread. They may hand you that piece of bread. Then you step next door to the person who has the cup, dip the bread lightly into the cup, and then consume both elements at once. But if you prefer to use these prepackaged elements, that's fine too. Just let the person who's holding the tray know that that's what you prefer to have. If you are someone who likes, needs, must have, gotta have gluten-free bread, if you need gluten-free bread, I need you to come to right here. As the people who serve at this point will have the gluten-free bread available for you. If you find it difficult or impossible, 
to come forward this day, but you would like to receive the elements, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Raise your hand. And the people who finish first serving their and we will bring the elements to you. As is our custom, before we get to the liturgy for the service, we'll be re I'll be reminding you of some folks in the family who need your prayers. We want to remember Carol Melchior. Carol is out of the hospital and at home. She is seeing the therapist that she needs. Um, Wayne says it'll be a few more weeks, and they do ask at this moment not to have visitors. That's Wayne and Carol Melchior. Oh, Marie wants us to remember the family of Reverend Bill Harder. I know Bill Harder in 1999 he and I and Ray Rourke, another Presbyterian pastor, led a group of people to Israel. And he was quite a person and a wonderful pastor. So that's the Bill Harder family. The Robinsons ask us to, ask us to remember the Pollock family, P-O-L-L-O-C-K. Uh, it says they're going through some rough times. And don't we all at some time? That's the Pollock family. Well, we got a good news from Melita. Melita wants us to know about a new life. Ezekiel Christopher Lee her great-grandson, born August 2nd, 2022. And if you need to know, seven pounds and 13 ounces. Good news for Ezekiel. More good news with the Fiedlers, John and Carol, celebrating their 51st wedding anniversary. Amen. John, you're a lucky man. I wanted to let you know, um, longtime members, Bernie and Elaine Sullivan, called this past week to say goodbye to me and to you. Because of Bernie's health, they are moving to what I call the Presbyterian Towers in Tampa. There's a wonderful Presbyterian church less than two blocks away, and he will be close to Moffat. So we wish them well as they go from Ocala to Tampa. It was my privilege, along with John Redden, on Thursday to visit with Joyce and Calvin Wonders, and we shared the elements of communion with them. They said to be sure and tell you how much they miss seeing you, and they hope to be back as soon as possible. Also, I want to thank Tom for playing this day. Turns out Raul, as of yesterday, did test positive for COVID. His wife, Ilsa, had it a couple of days before. As of yesterday, it's official that Raul has it too. So we want to remember Raul and Ilsa in our prayers this week. And Is it okay if I tell you good news? <laughs> Jack and Olga Marie Kohler, some time back, lost a dear member of their family, a Shih Tzu, that they had had for a long time. He was a very much a part of their family. And 
it's difficult to describe how much that can hurt. But God made us that way. And God made us to celebrate new time, new life. And yesterday, that Jack and Olga Marie were telling me that their breeder called and their puppy was born yesterday. <laughs> and you'll be seeing him today? That's terrific. Let us know when you get him. Let's pray. God of all creation, we gather here this day to accept the invitation to this, the table of our Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ. May we remind ourselves that we come here not as we the worthy and therefore deserving, but rather we come to the table as the sinful, but yet forgiven. We give you thanks and praise for your gracious love towards us, your wayward children. We thank you for your remarkable creation. We are in awe of the natural world you created. We praise you this day for all your gifts to us. God of the covenant, we recall your promises to your people Israel and give thanks for signs and wonders found in water and wind, fire and flame. We especially this day thank you for your ultimate gift to all Jesus the Christ. As we approach this table, let the model of Jesus be our guide. May we show strength in service. May we be humble yet sure. May we find joy in simplicity. May we care in fact, not in fiction, for all your children, especially for those who are the modern day equivalents of tax collectors, widows, orphans, strangers, outcasts. And may we recognize that in fact, sometimes God does have a kid's face. And that in fact, sometimes angels, your messengers are as real as the person sitting next to us. We trust that your Holy Spirit will be present among us this day and that this meal will symbolically be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples, even us, to pray for ourselves and for others by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. Let us remind ourselves why we do this. Hear now the words of institution. On the day of his betrayal and arrest, Jesus gathered his disciples for one last Passover meal together. At that meal, scripture tells us he gave thanks for the bread and then broke it. And said to them, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat, all of you, and do this remembering me. Scripture tells us that at that meal, Jesus gave thanks for the cup, held it up for them to see and said, this cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. And later in scripture, the apostle Paul reminds us but as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we do show forth the saving death of the Lord until he comes again. All is made ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
thank you for this opportunity to share these elements at this table. May the energy we receive from the elements sustain us in the days ahead. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Before the charge and the blessing, an invitation. I know some of you are considering membership here at Countryside. If you would like to join this day, it's a simple process. Go down the hallway to the one and only door on the left where members of session will be there to greet you. I want to tell you about Cindy and I's vacation. We had sort of a staycation. Um, I don't know if you noticed the price of gas lately. But, um, so we did some day trips on Tuesday, which was our 42nd anniversary. We did something we love to do. We kayaked down the Rainbow River, and then we ate at a restaurant we like in Dunellen. On Thursday, we went somewhere we hadn't been for but two and a half years, St. Augustine. And it's still there. Uh, <laughs> And if you've never eaten at a restaurant called A1A, I highly recommend it. But we had a nice, quiet week together, and I want to thank Del Ambler, who filled the pulpit for me last week. I understand that he did well, as I expected he would. My charge to you is this. You better be ready. God may want to communicate with you this week as you go through the week ahead. May God the Father... God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, bless, keep, and preserve you this day and every future day. Amen and amen. Amen.